be talking about the subject of psychosis and the different areas of DSM-4 that deal with this particular area. Do you remember what psychosis was? We said it was when the person in the stress model is not only not able to meet their needs in a safe way, that is neurosis, but they finally are so stressed out or something is going on in their brain or something physically has happened to them or they're on drugs that mess them up physically to such a point that they go into unreality of some sort in some way. And those unreality we call delusions. And they tend to have a whole series of different types of delusions. One is a delusion of grandeur. That means they see themselves in some exalted position, uh, like a movie star, or a god, or Jesus, or somebody. Because that is a way that they are then able to cope. Another one is guilt, that they've committed the unpardonable sin, or some grave error in their life. Another is ill health, that they have some terrible disease. Now remember when we're talking about a delusion, it means what? This is not really happening, but they are completely convinced of what is going on here. Jealousy, that their spouse has been unfaithful. And so when the person's convinced about this, there's no evidence whatsoever that that's the case, but they know that that's what, it, what it's like. Passivity that they're being controlled or manipulated by some outside influence, such as radio waves. You know, I'm just this robot, and these radio waves are telling me what to do, and that's what I do. Persecution. They feel that they're being interfered with, or people are out to get them. Poverty. They feel they face destitution, although they have ample money or a job. Reference. The patient feels they're being talked about, perhaps in the press or the TV. And thought control. They believe ideas are being put into their minds by others. That's what we call delusions. The next area is hallucinations. And these characteristics are the things that really wake you up, give you the red flag that you might be dealing with psychosis. False sensory perception that occurs in the absence of a related sensory stimulus. They just start seeing things, or they believe there are people there, or they believe other things. Auditory or visual hallucinations are most common. It must occur when the person is fully conscious, obviously in delirium, or when you're waking up in the morning, or, or whatever, you might be fully conscious. They're not illusions which are misinterpretations of sensory stimuli. Because many times a person can be off, there's a stimuli and they just don't understand what it is and they're misinterpreting it. These usually occur under conditions of decreased sensory input such as night. We're not talking about those things. We're talking about uh, uh, that's a misinterpretation of sensory perception. We're not talking about that. That's not considered a hallucination. The next characteristic is disorganized speech. Loose associations governed not by logic, but by rhymes, puns, and other rules not apparent to the observer or no rules at all. I mean, just the way they talk, they're not tracking, but it's just, you know, whatever seems to be the rhyme of the thing. Disorganized speech, it doesn't make sense must be so badly impaired that it manually interferes with communication. Disorganized behavior. Bizarre behavior which is not goal-oriented and for no apparent reason. Like taking off clothes in public, repeatedly making the sign of the cross, or assuming and maintaining certain postures. The last one is negative symptoms. Now we're going to take all of these things, we're going to put them together into particular problems, but these are the kind of things that you see that should wake you up and say, uh-oh, 
We got something going on here. Reduced range of expression or emotion. They're flat, they're blunted, you look at them and they're just... Seems like there's no one there. The lights are on, but they're not home. Markedly reduced amount or fluency in speech. They just don't talk or they aren't fluent in the way they're talking. Loss of a will to do things. Give the impression that something has been taken away. You sort of know what a viable human being is like. Well, these are unviable human beings. Reduce the apparent texture of richness of the patient's personality. They're just dull. Now we take all of those different symptoms and they can all talk about the different psychotic disorders and we can have a mixture of all of them. So now we're gonna try and break it out into those individual uh, areas and then talk about why it happens and what's going on and then eventually get to what do we need to do about these kind of things. The first type is called schizophrenia. And a lot of people have heard of that term. Uh, schizophrenia is 1% in the population worldwide and 3% of people that are divorced or separated. Now, why would that be the case? We don't really know. It could be that uh, divorced and separated people aren't as stable, they've been hurt more, uh, but it also could be that uh, maybe uh, people who have schizophrenia end up divorced and separated. Schizophrenia means a split between thoughts and emotions and a withdrawal from reality. It is not split personalities. This is not multiple personalities. They have to have the symptoms for at least one month for the patient has at least two delusions. One if they're really bizarre or hallucinations. One if there are two voices or there are comments on their thoughts and actions. So if in their brain, it's like there are two different people talking back and forth and the people are commenting about what they're doing, uh, you only need one of those to meet this criteria. Speech that shows incoherence, derailment, or disorganization. Severely disorganized or catatonic behavior. Catatonic behavior means the person just is spaced out, doesn't move, maybe freezes in a particular posture. Any negative symptoms such as flat effect, reduced speech, or a lack of volition. Now, if you just took those, could you find a lot of people maybe meet that? You could. At least six months. One month if they're clearly psychotic, the remainder of the time they have negative symptoms or two symptoms in an attenuated form. For most of the time, they're materially impaired in their ability to work, study, socialize, or provide self-care. And it's not due to mood, schizoaffective disorder, medical or substance abuse, or developmental disorder. Okay, so that's schizophrenia overall, got that? Now we're gonna look at types of schizophrenia. The first is the paranoid type, and this is the most usual one. They feel persecuted. They have delusions and auditory hallucinations, but not many negative symptoms, disorganized speech or catatonic behavior. These are the ones that primarily uh, they have these hallucinations or delusions that you know, people are out to get them, but otherwise they seem to function fairly normally. They meet the criteria for schizophrenia. They're preoccupied with the delusions or have frequent auditory hallucinations. They have none of the following. They don't have the disorganized speech. They don't have the disorganized behavior. They have inappropriate or flat effect or catatonic behavior. So that's paranoid type. Next type, disorganized type. Negative symptoms in disorganized speech and behavior more prominent than delusions and hallucinations. They meet the basic criteria and all of the symptoms are prominent. They have disorganized behavior, disorganized speech, 
effect that is flat or inappropriate, but they're not catatonic. So what would this person look like? The first person looks pretty normal, except they have all these delusions about being persecuted. What does this one look like? This one is flat, this one has problems with speech, with behavior, they're sort of out of it. Then we have the catatonic type, and that's excessive, retarded, or excited behavior, or bizarre behavior. They might have stupor or motor immobility, meaning that they just don't move. Hyperactivity does, that does not have an apparent purpose. It is not influenced by external stimuli. Mutism or marked negativism. A particular behavior such as posturing, stereotypes, mannerisms, or grimacing. They just do very different things than the average person does. Echolalia, repeating words that are just spoken or rhyming. That they just are doing bizarre things is what it comes down to. Then we have an undifferentiated type. That's where it's a mixture of all five types. And then we have a residual type. That means they have acute psychosis, but they've remarkably approved. But they still have some unusual odd behavior. And so you would then give a diagnosis of schizophrenia for those with the different types that we just talked about. Now, there are some other ones that seem quite a bit like it that we have to make sure you don't get confused with. The first one is called schizophreniform disorder. You have all the symptoms, but you're ill only from one to six months. Remember, schizophrenia, it has to be over six months. So the person sort of acts schizophrenic, but it's less than six months. And schizoaffective disorder, for at least one month, the symptoms of schizophrenia and mania or depression are present. For two weeks, they do not have mood systems with delusions and hallucinations. Mood during a substantial part. So what are we saying? This seems like a combination between a mood disorder that we're going to be talking about later and schizophrenia. But we have both. Okay? Then we have another category, and th these are disorders with delusions. The first one is called a delusional disorder, non-bizarre delusions for one month with no other symptoms or marked deterioration. Usually this is later in life. I had a client like this that believed that the neighbor was spying on him. See, is it possible that the neighbor is spying on him? That could actually happen, right? So it's not bizarre. It's not like the Martians are visiting him or something like that, right? Shared psychotic disorder. This is very rare. When the patient develops delusions similar to those of a relative or close associate. Somebody has, is struggling with delusions and the other person believes the delusions and now those are their delusions. That's shared psychotic disorder. We have some other psychotic disorders. There's psychotic disorder due to general medical condition. What would that say? It's like they have neurosyphilis, okay? And that's why they're acting that way, but it's totally based on some medical thing. Substance abuse psychotic disorder. This is the most usual one that we see. Somebody is on something like crack or meth, and they just get so much of it that the brain just ends up hallucinating, all sorts of ideas. Disorders with psychosis as a symptom. See, the problem to all these things is we've got to decide, is it this or is it something else where that psychosis goes along with it? You can have psychosis with mood disorders. You can have psychosis with personality disorders. So we have to make sure it's none of those before we would give one of these particular diagnoses. Diagnoses that masquerade as psychosis. There's specific phobia. Sometimes that can get the person to be so afraid that they can act like they're psychotic. Mental retardation. Somatization disorder. Sometimes they have pseudo-hallucinations. Factitious disorder. 
they're making up the delusions of the hallucinations to look like they're sick so they can get out of something. Or malingering. They feign disorders to obtain money, avoid work or punishment. So how do we distinguish between the, schizo the schizophrenia and the other disorders? The first is the type of information. Psychotic symptoms, the delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, you have to have those. And you have to have two or more of those for at least a month and for a significant portion of time. Those are the different ideas here. If you think, of, look at the time. How long has it been? And then we have some that you have to have bizarre, but you have to meet the criteria. What if a person does have schizophrenia, what does it look like? Well, usually schizophrenia is going to start in teenage or early adulthood. They're going to be doing just fine, and all of a sudden they're going to start getting bizarre, things are going to start happening, and usually they start happening under stress. It takes something that triggers it. Like one particular case that I know of, they believe that this kid was doing just fine until he started using marijuana. And marijuana triggered the schizophrenia. Lack of precipitating factors and or extreme stress. We don't believe that that's the cause, but that can contribute to it. Do you see what I'm saying? Not a prior history of a complete recovery from psychosis. Not good or social or job-related history before the psychotic symptoms appeared. So basically, they're doing okay, and now we have a problem. And they have sort of three phases they talk about. Deterioration in functioning then the active phase where the symptoms predominate, and then the residual phase where it seems to recede and go back. They're better recovery when they had good prior functioning. If they're sort of been messed up for a long period of time and never functioned well, it's better if they'd functioned well, there's a better chance of recovering overall. Consequence of the illness, social or occupational, functioning seriously Im impaired, usually do not marry or hold anything but menial jobs at the very best. It affects their family. Again, it's not substance, it's not mood disorder, it's not general medical condition. Other things you might consider that are not real DSM-4 criteria are close relatives with schizophrenia or bipolar with psychotic features. Schizophrenia usually begins in the mid-20s. If they're 40, it's probably something else. If it's over 40 when this starts, it's probably something else. So what are the causes? 10% of people that have schizophrenia have first-order relatives that also have schizophrenia. 40 to 60% of identical twins. If one of them has schizophrenia, the other one has schizophrenia. So it can't be totally genetic, can it? If it was totally genetic, then all of the identical twins would have it. The medical model says as excessive dopamine, this is what's called type 1 schizophrenia, and that makes their brain fire too often. And that the confusion, that one schizophrenic that I was uh, working with said it was like his mind had two tracks. There were two things he was thinking about at the same time. Antipsychotic drugs bind to the dopamine D2 receptor. What does it tell us? If we're blocking this particular receptor and it makes them better, it says that must have something to do with it. Another way that you see it to make it pretty clear that it has to do with dopamine and other neurotransmitters is the fact that a person that has too much dopamine acts like they're sort of schizophrenic. And if they have too little dopamine, they act like they have Parkinson's disease. And so like in Parkinson's disease, they give a drug called the dopa. And if they give them too much of this drug, guess what? They act schizophrenic. So that's why we're pretty sure this has to do with the neurotransmitter imbalance of some sort here. Amphetamine psychosis. 
Again, amphetamines release dopamine and they act like they're schizophrenic. Another study has suggested that maybe they have a larger than normal number of dopamine receptors on their neurons. So therefore, they can receive more than the average person does. But we now have a type 2. That's type 1 schizophrenia. Type 2 schizophrenia seems like it's excessive serotonin. These are the ones that have the more negative symptoms. The type 1 are the more like the uh, uh, paranoid and so on. The type 2 have the more negative symptoms. And what's interesting about it is the atypical antipsychotics, like uh, clozapine, work better for these than they work for the others. And what's the difference? The clozapine affects both the D1 and the D2, a dopamine and serotonin receptors. So from all of that, that's why they believe that there's a large component concerning the neurotransmitters in the person's brain. They also can see an abnormal brain structure. The ventricles are larger on the left side. This is true more for people with negative and fewer positive symptoms and poor response to the drugs. But some people with the same thing in their brain never develop schizophrenia. So we don't have the whole picture, do we? We have some things here that sort of make sense. Other suggested theories is regression, due to primary narcissism, that's a psychodynamic theory. The behavioral theory, it's a lack of reinforcers. Family structure is that sometimes in families that have double binds, marital conflict, woman dominance, those kind of things seem to have higher level of schizophrenia. So what is it probably? A combination of a number of things, right? Treatment of all sorts of different things that are done to try to help this particular thing. Most of the time now, uh, schizophrenics are put on the antipsychotic drugs and kept pretty much in society and they try to help them through uh, different kinds of uh, counseling in therapeutic communities like with token economies, that kind of stuff. The drugs block the receptors so the body develops new healthy ones. That's one of the theories, that these drugs block the receptors and the body now is getting healthy receptors. The problem is the drugs have their own problems, right? It'd be very nice if we had a drug that we could just take and it made you feel okay and you could just keep the people on this. What are the different things you see? My experience again with schizophrenia is that the people were very interesting, but it wasn't the symptoms that are on this list because they were all on medication and it was the symptoms of the medication that you would see. It wasn't the symptoms of the schizophrenia. As an example, one is uh, dystonia, involuntary muscle contractions. Restlessness or agitation, pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth, pacing back and forth. That's not a sign of schizophrenia, that's a sign of the drugs that they're taking. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome. The muscles get rigid, fever, altered consciousness. Uh, it can even lead to death. The most usual one that's known of is the scardiff uh, dyskensia. When taken for more than a year, involuntary tick-like movements of the tongue, the mouth, and the whole body. 20 to 30% get it to some degree especially as they get older. Possibly higher with a type 2 type of schizophrenia may not be reversible. So you see the problem, we got this drug, it's helping them function better, but they get these things that can totally destroy them, can even kill them, or they have these symptoms now for the rest of their life. Uh, the good thing is that on a clozapine, which is an atypical uh, drug, they don't get as much of this. What's the negative? On clozapine, they get something different. A granulose lithium suggests a mood disorder. Uh, schizophrenia usually begins in the mid-20s. If they're 40, it's probably something else. If it's over 40 when this starts, it's probably something else. So what are the causes? 
10% of people that have schizophrenia have first order relatives that also have schizophrenia. 40 to 60% of identical, usually it's used in conjunction with the medication. In almost all cases, people with schizophrenia uh, are going to be on medication. Doesn't always work for all of them, by the way. Active insight role with boundaries, case management, a therapeutic relationship is really critical. I want you to think about something here. How would you feel if you were out in society and you had all this weird stuff going on and everybody looked at you as weird and off the wall and you couldn't function as good as other people and you couldn't really hold a job, how would you feel? How would you react? Think you might, you might be a little bit angry? Do you think that maybe you might not exactly be fit into social situations? Can you think of the whole self-worth thing that would be going on inside of you? Of all the things that'd be happening? See, sometimes we get confused between what the real problem is and then the psychological effects of the problem of how the person sees themselves and the struggles and the frustration that they go through and then maybe an inability to handle criticism because they feel so bad about themselves so they end up doing things and blowing up and other stuff that they shouldn't be doing. So you get the picture if this was you and you had all these limitations in your life and you're trying to make it in life and you're comparing yourself to all these healthy people out there. How would you be feeling? How would you react? How would you cope? What defenses might you put up? teaching social skills because a lot of these people don't have good social skills. But if you had this since you were a teenage, where are you going to develop your social skills? Educate family members so they'll treat them more humanely and see them in a more rational way here. Sometimes day hospitals, halfway houses, occupational training, sometimes uh, coaches in occupational training. Some of the clients that I've worked with uh, made it with a coach on a job for like six months. But then what would usually happen? They'd be overwhelmed with a the job. They'd say, well, I really can't do this. This is too hard for me. And then they would end up quitting. Even if they were very, you know, like working at a, you know, hamburger place or, or places like that, or working in a, a school or other stuff where they tried to place them, they would eventually be overwhelmed and end up quitting. And now they're basically on the street or they're in the system. And of course, most of these people get an SSI, so they provide housing for them and so on, and uh, medication. But can you see how you'd be struggling? You have these limitations. Your, your mind just doesn't work like other people's minds. You just can't do the things other people can do. And how well do you fit in with society? How well do you relate? How well do you feel accepted? You really don't. Outcomes about 1% to 30% require continued hospitalization. 25 to 40 percent can return to their homes on the medication. Most survive on government disability. 33 percent of the street people have severe mental disorders, something like this. 1 to 30 percent recover completely. Okay, now we have that whole picture. And again, this is one of those areas of a real dichotomy. The dichotomy is what? This is all physical. Just put them on medication. That's the best we can do to help them. We'll give them some uh, uh, bioelect uh, bioelect dialectical uh, behavioral training. Uh, we'll uh, teach them some skills, and that's the best we can do. It's over. Pretty much write them off. What's another area that's not covered normally in society concerning this? The spiritual. So if we're looking at this, let's look at the spiritual now, and I'm going to get a challenge for you. I want to look at some spiritual stories, and I want you to evaluate these people, and let's try and decide and look at some of the symptoms. Remember we had those symptoms of schizophrenia there? Well, let's see if any of those symptoms appear in any of our stories from the Bible. And let's just see what it seems to say. And the most usual one that we know about 
And it's given three different places in the Bible. We're just going to look at two of them. And these are the, this is the story when the person that has a demon that called himself Legion confronts Jesus. And let's look at that a little bit. Here's Mark 5, 2. And when he was come out of the ship, that is Jesus, immediately that met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Now, what's an unclean spirit? Well, you could think of a demon, but I'm going to suggest it means a little bit more to that. See, a person, remember we have, if you have a spirit of lust, what does it try to do? Make you lustful. If you have a spirit that's unclean, what's it going to tend to do? Make you unclean. This is a person that doesn't take care of himself very well. This is a person that has all these negative things working on him. Did we see that at all in schizophrenia? Yes, we did. Who had his dwelling among the tombs? He's a street person, right? And no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Now, see, that is a clear indication of spirits, isn't it? How many of you, even if you get mad enough, can break chains? Remember the sons of Sceva? That they tried to cast out the demons and they just, this one guy jumped on a number of them and beat them all up and threw them out in the street. If you see that kind of supernatural level of power, many times that's an indication that we're dealing with spirits. Because he had often been bound in fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. Now, why are they trying to tame him? What symptom is this? I'm suggesting paranoia. Can you get somebody to cooperate with you if the person thinks you're the enemy and they're out, you're out to get them? So that might be paranoia there. And I was day and night, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Now, who are the people that cut themselves with stones? Cutters. What do we usually know? It's emotional, isn't it? So he might be dealing with schizoaffective here. That we have this schizophrenia, maybe type 2 or type 1, and we have the emotional thing, the cutting, the, that kind of stuff going on in this person. Now let's pick it up in uh, Luke 8, 27. And when he went forth to land, the same story, there met him out of the city a certain man which had devil's long time and wear no clothes. Remember the disorganized behavior? One of the examples we had there is sometimes they inappropriately take off their clothes. Neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou God of the Most High? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit, again, negative symptoms, to come out of the man. For oftentimes it had caught him. And he was uh, kept bound with chains and fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. Could that possibly be rejection? Why does the person stay away from the town? Because they feel rejected. They feel worthless. They feel like they're no good. The people don't relate to them. This lack of social functioning. Jump down to verse 33. And when the devils were out of the man, they entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down the deep place into the lake and were choked. Spirits can deal with, un animals can't really defend themselves. But see, what are we talking about? In hallucinations and delusions, uh, spirits can take advantage of that, of the physical incapacity to really defend themselves. And they went out to see what was done, verse 35, and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So what are we saying? It seems that not only were the demons cast out, 
but whatever problem he had in his mind, it was healed. He's thinking straight. He's not having the different symptoms that we're talking about here. And notice this, a very interesting verse. They also which saw it told them by what means he was possessed of the devils was healed. It didn't say was cast out. It said was healed. So it seems like what we're talking about here, we have two things. We have to deal with the spirits, but we have to deal with the physical healing of the mind. So now let's look more about the spirit end of this, because that's the area that's not normally covered. A lot of the rest of the stuff I told you how it was covered, we dealt with all that. The first thing we need to do to help these people, especially if we're dealing with spirits, we believe we are, is teach them that they have power over the spirits, don't we? Because do spirits have power over us today? Only if we don't defend our minds. Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So that's one step. What's another one? Remember the story of the uh, deaf and dumb man that was brought to Jesus and the disciples couldn't cast out the demons? And, after, and it seemed like the person maybe had epilepsy or something like that because they were thrown into the fire and they were having convulsions and all sorts of stuff was going on. And what did Jesus do? He cast out the spirits and the person was healed. But then one of the disciples said, why couldn't we cast them out? What did they say? Because this one comes out only by prayer and fasting. What's it saying? Some of these things are going to take some real faith to get a hold of, to see the kind of miracles that we need to see to get these people delivered from this kind of stuff. This may not be some easy thing. It's going to take some really pressing in and some real prayer, right? Another thing we need to get from the scriptures in dealing with spirits like this, and from the spiritual aspect of this, uh, Matthew 12, 43. And when an unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came. And when he is come, he findeth it empty and swept and garnished. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter into and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it also be with this wicked generation. What's it saying? It's not good enough to just cast out the spirits. You're going to have to deal with the physical problem, the psychological problem, what it was that made the opening for the spirits to have an advantage to come in and affect this person. We need to fill that empty space with Jesus in some way to help them build a relationship to fight this off. Now let's look at another aspect. What kind of, and we're talking more in the therapy end of it now. We're talking, yes, we do need the physical, but let's look at the therapy end of this thing. Ephesians 6.11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles? His deceptions, his taking advantage of problems that people have, and we're going to have to stand against those. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and doing all to stand. Now, one of the issues that's interesting here, and that I've had the experience of, is that people are on the edge of psychosis. They're sort of, well, am I going to go off into never and ever land and open myself up to this whole spiritual world? The devil will take advantage of them, and he will tell them that either they've committed the unpardonable sin, or that they are not saved and they're going to hell. Now, why would, that, why would spirits tend to go that direction? If you ask yourself, are we really dealing with spirits here? Well, tell me why a brain malfunction would tell you you've committed the unpardonable sin. Or tell you you're going to hell. 
See, a lot of the different things and a lot of the symptoms that we're talking about, remember we were also talking about symptoms of schizophrenia, of voices talking to you and telling you and commenting on your behavior? Well, either we have some very interesting brain malfunctions that go on, do you see what I'm saying? Or we have something else that's taking advantage of that and we believe that that is spirits. This one particular boy that uh, came in that had had schizophrenia and he would get, begin, he uh, thought he'd commit the unpardonable sin. Well, if he believed that, what effect would that have in his life? If you've committed the unpardonable sin, it's over. There's nothing you can do. You're going to hell. So can you cope with life? No, you just as well go into unreality, into schizophrenia, turn yourself over totally to the spirits and let them have full control. So there's something here that is really going on. What am I suggesting? We're going to have to help that person put on that armor of God and get to the place that they fight off those thoughts and win the battle over those thoughts. And that's what we're talking about right here, that we withstand in the evil day. And it says, therefore... Having your loins girt about with truth. We've got to deal with the lies that the person believes. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, doing what's right. Can the devil get you when you're doing what's right? No, most people he gets by making them feel that they're guilty, that they're bad, that they're no good, and so on and so forth. And your feet shod with a preparation of the gospel of peace. What does that mean? that you have the grace of God, the unmerited favor in your life, that God accepts you, and you have the peace of God, that you're okay. How much do you think people struggling with this need this? And above all, take in the shield of faith. That's what, defend your mind. You gotta know what's true, you gotta believe what's true, and wherein you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Those spirits are going to put thoughts in your mind trying to get you to believe that you're no good, that you're worthless, that you're going to account for nothing. you just as well kill yourself or, you ought to, or everyone's against you. See, the idea is, I'm not saying that their fault. I'm saying they got opened up to it through the problem, but now the spirits are taking advantage of that and planting all sorts of thoughts. We don't have the defenses, and because we don't have the defenses, they pretty much take over, and the person believes the delusions, the person sees the hallucinations, but they don't have any defenses. So we've got to teach them to use the defenses here. And take the helmet of salvation. Knowing that you're saved. See, when the devil's trying to tell them they're not saved, why? How are we going to do that? And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. They're going to need to declare and know the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching. What are you watching for? The deceptions of the devil, where he can get power. He has no power unless he can convince you. Thereunto with all perseverance and supplications for all saints. Before we end, let's take that one. How are we going to convince them that they haven't committed the unpardonable sin? You're going to have to go to the Word of God. So what does the Word of God say about that, and can we prove it from the Word of God? Because if you can't, because a lot of people, eh, I don't know exactly what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. And what is that? And what does it really mean? Let me read you a couple of verses here and I want to show you something. This is Matthew 12, 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. And whoso speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But he so speaketh against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Now that's a very interesting statement. Let me read you one other verse. This is Mark 3, 29. But he that shall blaspheme against the Holy Spirit hath never forgiveness, but is in danger of eternal damnation. And the word there in the Greek is subject to. So it's saying, and is going to hell. Well, what is the only sin that is going to take you to hell? The rejection of the Holy Spirit. 
that you don't accept him, the Holy Spirit has to work in your life to draw you to Christ. And if you won't allow yourself to be drawn to Christ, you're not saved. And if you're not saved, you are subject to eternal damnation. So what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit? It's basically doing whatever you do. You can call him names, you can do whatever, but you're driving the Holy Spirit out of your life and you're saying, I want nothing to do with you. If you want nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, can you be saved? Therefore, you can't be forgiven. Do you see what we're talking about there? So now, how are we going to convince somebody, though, that believes that they have blasphemed the Holy Spirit and they're not saved? How are we going to convince them? Let's go to just a few more verses here. Let's go to Romans 8, 9. For ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if a man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So a person that is saved has what? The Holy Spirit. A person that is not saved does not have the Holy Spirit. How do we tell the difference between a person that has the Spirit and doesn't have the Spirit? Well, here's a little story. There was a lady, and she wanted to join this particular church many years ago, and she went before the elders and they asked her the question. Are you saved? Yes. Well, how do you know you're saved? Let me ask you a question. Before you were saved, did you sin? Yes. Now that you're saved, do you sin? Yes. Well, then what's the difference? This is what she said. She said, well, before I was saved, I chased after sin. Now that I'm saved, I run away from it, but sometimes it still catches me. What are we saying here? It's what's inside the person. If the person wants to serve God and wants to do what is right, they are saved, even if they're not totally acting like it in all the ways we might like. If they really don't want to serve God and they want to do their own thing, they're not saved. But see, what you get people here is you get very saved people that are dealing with schizophrenia or on the edge of psychosis, and the devil convinces them they've committed the unpardonable sin and that they're not saved. Well, what you do is you show them, well, do you really want to serve God and do right? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, guess what? We know you're saved. And of course, you can go back to Romans 10, 9 and make sure that they have committed their life to Christ uh, and they believe that Jesus rose from the dead and that they've made him Lord of their life and so on. But the idea is you have to show them in themselves that they are saved and they are okay. Let's put the treatment plan all together here. The first thing we're going to have to deal with, and this is spec again, remember? Okay, when we're dealing with spirits, we're going to have to teach them that they have authority over those spirits, teach them to use the armor of God, and replace the deceptions with the truth. Convince them they haven't committed the impardonable sin, they are actually saved. Cast out the spirits and replace that emptiness inside of them that the spirit's filled with the Holy Spirit in a personal relationship with Jesus. Physically, encourage medication as soon as possible. Research says the sooner they get on the medication, the better their chance of full recovery. Yeah, I know some people will say, man, that's almost sacrilege to say you need medication, but in some cases, that is definitely the case. Reduce stress. If stress is one of the things that tends to bring this on, reduce stress. Teach on faith, healing, and prayer. Because if we're really going to get full recovery, it's probably going to take faith healing in this particular case. Medication by itself isn't going to be good enough in most cases. Experientially, unconditional support in the empathy. Try and understand where they're coming from, of why they're struggling, and what it's like to be inside of their body. Teach skills training. Uh, try to make them useful in some function, whether it's volunteering or a, a job or something, so they can feel better about themselves. Support groups if they're ready for it. You don't put somebody with paranoia in a support group until they made some recovery. And relationship skills. They need all of those kind of things. And finally, in choices. If they made bad choices, if they've committed sins, they need to repent of those sins and be forgiven. 
So I'm believing that there's a whole blend here of the different things that are required on dealing especially in the area of psychosis and in schizophrenia and things like that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you give us answers. And sometimes your answers... Lord, I just through faith. And Lord, that's the, the one that's the most powerful, Lord, that we ask that you give us the faith to apply our faith and these people to have faith in a total victory there. But you also give us medication. You also give us a help and therapy and other things in our lives, Lord. And we ask that you would give us wisdom in applying these in the lives of these people in Jesus' name.